All right, slime rockets. What we wanna do, what I think is gonna be best is we'll take and break this thing up into two. We're gonna take a look at the lake trout because that's we're pretty famous for the lake trout in terms of the light line fishing for them and whatnot. We'll take a look at them, use about an hour or so of that, and then we'll take a look at the rainbows. And with the rainbows, when we talk about the rainbows, if I'm not saying cutthroat or brown trout, just understand it will work for the same thing. It'll work for the same techniques when we get to that. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the lake trout first. I didn't bring in a bunch of tackle because it's all pretty simple stuff. You've seen it. We'll talk about the techniques involved, more about locating them, how to find those big fish, how to get your numbers, that type of thing. That's what we want to get involved with. Okay, <clears throat> let's roll in for the steelhead here, guys, or for steelhead, for the, for the lake trout. The lake trout, and this is one of the things that, once again, I'll stand on my soapbox for a minute, you know, they're trying to kill all these fish off. And what's happened is, you know, Ponderay, they got nets everywhere, they want to kill them off. They've gone up and tried to kill off Upper Priest Lake. They want to kill off Lower Priest Lake. And what you have to understand is, okay, what's happening? Just to give you a brief little overview of this. Back in the 70s, they planted a little shrimp called a mysid shrimp. That's what you always hear about, a little shrimp. And what that was put in the water to do was to boost the amount of nutrients in the water for the small kokanee to feed on, for the cutthroat and the bull trout and whatnot. A couple years after they'd done that, you were getting record kokanee, you know, pretty like six pound, nine ounce kokanee. All these big kokanee happened at Kootenai Lake. It happened all over the place where they put these in. You had all these banner catches coming. You talk to the old guys that were fishing pretty like before I was even alive, and it was 30, 40, 50 pounders. It was no big deal. They had a tagging program up there in the 70s, and these guys were hauling in 40, 45 pounders. I mean, and it was several. Then what started to happen was it started to taper off. And the immediate blame went, okay, where are all the bull trout? Well, when I first started going to Priest Lake when I was a kid, we could go out in the spring of the year, we'd go up Memorial Day, stay at Lionhead. You could throw out a weight with an egg hook and a couple of Plotsky's eggs, salmon eggs, and you could catch bull trout all day long off the dock. Anywhere from that big to, you know, three, four, five pounds, whatever. Well, I remember vague, I mean, when I was a kid, I can remember guys catching those and they'd throw them right on the beach, bull trout, throw them on the beach, it's a trash fish, it's an undesirable. You just see them, what, I remember asking my uncle, why, what is, what is, why is this? Oh, because they eat everything. Well, now we've come full circle, we want to get them back, they're not around. But what you have to understand, <clears throat> and I don't... I hate it when guys, you know, they're going out and they're offering this bounty, $15 a fish. And there's guys buying boats and everything else off this bounty. And they're doing it drop shot and they tell me I made this much money. You know, that's fine, I guess, if that's what you want to do. But once again, you've got to think past tomorrow. You've got to think about what's going to happen down the road. And just to tell you what has happened with the shrimp, <clears throat> so that you understand that when you hear this stuff going on, you can say, okay, I understand what's happened. What they didn't account for when they put the mysid shrimp in was that the mysid shrimp feed all the nutrients out of the water. They take it all out. So now what happened when your kokanee go through their cycles and your small fish go through their cycles to spawn and you have your fry, there's no little tiny planktons in there for them to eat. Those mysid shrimp multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. You got big massive clouds of them roaming around and they just wipe all the nutrients out of the water. So now what happens is there's nothing for those small fish to feed on. You say, okay, the Lakers, how do they make it? <clears throat> it's two problems. What's happened as a kid walking the streams in Lionhead and Indian Creek and those places, as you have logging and you have runoff, things change, and the river stream changes. The spawning habitat has virtually disappeared in those streams. What you have to realize about the lake trial and why it's so prolific is because it's a broadcast spawner. It spawns within the lake. Your kokanee will spawn within the lake, but they'll also run the streams. 
And the primary a lot of times is the streams. Priest Lake, Granite Creek, one of the main ones. Bull trout, they got to run the streams to spawn. That spawning habitat is gone. I can remember as a little kid going up to Indian Creek where the falls were at and seeing huge bull trout swimming around in there in the fall. You don't see it anymore because the creek has changed. They can't get there. They can't get there. Exactly. All of it has changed. And what the blame is in society, just like with people and with fish and everything else, hunting, is to blame the undesirable. There's no deer around because of the cougars. There's no deer around because the bald eagles are coming back and they take the fawns and they do whatever. There's no salmon and steelhead left because all the pikemen will eat them. There's no kokanee left because the lake trout ate them all. Well, you have to understand, if you go down to the Snake River and the Columbia Rivers, they're paying guys $80,000 a year to catch pike minnow. Has your run gotten better? What's happened is now you've got walleye in there. You've got smallmouth bass in there like crazy. Those smallies, I can go down there and catch two, three hundred of those smallmouth. They're that big, and I get them when they're schooling up on smolts. You crank them in, and they're puking out smolts. If you launched a bounty right now to go down and wipe out the smallmouth bass, there'd be an uproar because it's a desirable fish. The pike minnow, we don't eat it. It's not sporting. Let's just use that as the reasoning skills behind why we're going to take them out. Do they eat some? Yes. You go down there and talk to the guys that are hardcore catching those pike minnows. They're using crickets and stuff. Got a buddy that does it. They're using crickets. Why aren't you using some type of spoon, some type of minnow imitation for it? The lake trout, guys. What's happened with the lakers is they've found a way to survive. When you go catch a lake trout, everybody says, you know, they're not good eating. I'm here to tell you, at my nice trim size, they eat all day long. See this girth? This isn't created by granola. Okay? They are the best eating fish. Right, Chad? They are the best eating fish, trout-wise, that you're going to catch. They're like eating a sockeye salmon. No, because what they're going to do is you're going to do it right. In Priest Lake, is there an overpopulation of smaller fish? Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Those fish, guys, if you get those fish that are, you know, two to four, five, six pounds, oh, they're incredible. Why are they incredible? When you, when you see flamingos on TV and they're all brilliant pink, that's at that time of the year. They're feeding on shrimp. The rest of the time, they're white. They change that color based on the forage that they eat. The lake trout, yeah, them lakers are gray and pasty. They're eating meat. The lakers that you're going to keep, when you catch them, and I, I don't know if you read the newspaper article and went up with Rich Landers. I told him, he, he's like, eh, I've ate a couple, but eh. I said, let me just, I'm going to hand pick you some. And I went up there and hand picked them some. He went home. They had a big barbecue with some employees from Spokesman. And he emailed me the next day freaking out. What you have to do is look at the fish. If the inside of his mouth is dark pink. If his flesh tone is a pinkish brown, that is an eater. Because they're feeding on shrimp. They're feeding on shrimp. Those bigger fish that you catch in there, they're eating on pike minnow. And guys, the kokanee are coming back in that lake. And it's all hush hush. The big cutthroat are coming back in that lake. And it's all hush hush. They let Mother Nature take care of it. And it's doing its thing. The bull trout? No. Because efforts have to be put forth in the spawning streams and habitat for them to come back. The problem is that's the most expensive form of rehab to go in and redo stream beds. What the Lakers have found a way to do is those fish, when you guys go out and they fish 180, 200 feet, that's fine. That's what we've all been taught. But what happens, and you can catch them down there, don't get me wrong, but are you going to catch them as frequently as the way we fish them? I say no. 
what has happened, you'll go out and catch those fish. And I grew up, guys, fishing that thing with downriggers way down the bottom, using flashers, using dodgers and flies, all the usual suspects, spoons, and you get seven to eight, nine pounder, a big fish. Maybe a 13 pounder every now and then. Guys that do it all the time, Roger, you may get more. You're living there, you're putting in a lot more time. With what we have to do is percentage fish. I gotta go out, get on the fish, make them hit. I don't have days and days and days to make it happen. What we found is that through trolling, we always caught fish that were smaller. And I got to thinking, okay, why is this, why is this, bigger baits, this, that, and trying all this crazy stuff. When we started drop shotting, the first big fish we caught was 27 pounds up there. We had been trolling all day long at our usual spots. 150, 180 feet, finishing up a trolling show, catching small fish. Told Dad, we're going to go over and try that shelf. Come back at about 11 o'clock. Dad drops down, 27 pounder, within like 20 minutes, in 28 feet of water, on a July day, with a surface temperature, 70 degrees. Okay, was that a fluke? I don't know. Crank it in, we pull back up. The next time back through, we get a 17 pounder. And I'm seeing these huge arches. 28 to 35 feet of water. Land that fish, come back through. This is amazing. Going back through there again. We get one that's about 13, 14 pounds. Bring it up, hanging out of its mouth is a fish about that long. All I see is the tail. So I reach in, pull it out. The drop shot's just stuck right on top of its mouth. There was no way it was going to be able to eat it. It's just the beauty of the drop shot. We'll get to it. But I pull this fish out. And it's a 12 inch pike minnow. And it's half digested. The head of it's all digested and the rest of it's brandy new. I mean, he couldn't get it all the way down. He was just kind of working it down in there. Okay? So I was thinking, okay, there's something here. So we did that show, did our thing. Mickey and I were out, Pond Ray Lake. And around that same time frame, the pike minnow, I noticed, come in to spawn. And there's a lot of them. Thousands of them. And if the pike minnow are so bad, why aren't they wiping those out of ponder, right? If they're eating everything. Got me? So what I got to thinking, I'll tell you a funny story. If you ever go pike minnow fishing in a spawn like that, and your partner falls asleep, oh, Mickey's asleep, right? And I'm catching these pike minnow, and when you squeeze them, they kind of do their thing. <laughs> and it's really hot out. And Mickey wakes up, what's that smell? Oh. And he's, he's kind of coated. <laughs> it's a good trick. It was good, wasn't it, Mick? He still works for me, I don't know why. I don't know why. There you go. But anyway, so what I, what I counted that when those fish were up there in that shallow water, guys, is what they're doing especially in the summertime like that, is they're tracking up on those shallow areas and they're following the pike minnow on and they're dropping back down. They can't stay up there. It's too warm to stay up there. They come up and those fish will circle on once or twice a day. And you gotta stay there and you just gotta be persistent. It's one of those things, remember I told you, I know they're here. It's the same thing. Then what happens is they drop down. And my belief is the smaller fish down there, they cruise around with their mouth open in 180 feet and all they have to do is just pull in, because there's just clouds of those shrimp. They're just pulling them in as they swim around. The big boys, that's not enough reward for the effort. That's why they're not the pink color. They gotta come up and they gotta get that meat. Now those Lakers aren't as big as they used to be because a pike minnow doesn't have near the protein of a kokanee, red flesh fish, more fat, more nutrients. Dorshack smallies get big because of that, all that nutrients. But they've, they've found a way to adapt, because when that first started happening, guys, these guys would catch these Lakers up there, and they'd have a big old massive head and no body. A 30-pound fish was probably weighing 13 pounds, because there was no nutrients. They were basically eating their body. Now they've found a way to adapt. They've found a way to adapt, and we're just capitalizing on that adaptation of coming up shallow. Because I don't care what you read, you will not see anything that tells you to fish for lake trout in 28 feet of water. It will not happen. I don't care what show you watch. It will not happen. 
It happens here because they have to find a way to adapt. And that's what they've done. 